So, good afternoon, buenas tardes, buen, uh, buenos dias, good morning, good night, and so on. So, today is a pleasure to have here uh, Luis Rosales from Tel Costa Rica to give an industrial talk. And uh, this industrial talk is uh, today. Uh, is organized by IEEE uh, Sequence System Society Chapter Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, also IEEE Council on India Chapter Brazil, and uh, this time also uh, with uh, IEEE Sequence System Society Chapter Costa Rica. Uh, so we have here today Ronnie Garcia, that is the chair of the chapter, that will be the section the session chair of PISART. So thank you very much, Luis Carlos, to accept our invitation. Thank you, Ronnie, to be the session chair. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. I hope you hear me well. Um, yes. Yeah, OK, good. My name is Ronnie Garcia. I am a professor in the Instituto Tecnológico de Costa Rica. I, I'm also the chair of the IEEE CAS chapter here in Costa Rica. And on behalf of both the Brazilian and the Costa Rican IEEE CAS chapters, it is a pleasure to me to welcome you today and our industrial talk today uh, titled Intel Costa Rica Transformation from Manufacturing to Design Center. So for today's talk, it is my honor to introduce to you uh, our main speaker, who is Luis Carlos Alquiza. Luis Carlos is an engineering manager at Intel Costa Rica uh, from the Client Computing Group, CCG currently responsible for the design uh, of methodologies and modeling behind the Intel's EWO platform. So this is really cool. And uh, prior to this, Luis was part of Intel's competitive analysis unit for three years, helping shape the projections for the future products and integration with third party players in the computing platform development ecosystem. Prior to this, Intel, uh, prior to his work at Intel, Luis was part of Hewlett Packard networking R&D operation here in Costa Rica. He, as a part of the ASIC design, uh, he uh, worked on, I'm sorry, I, he was working on the ASIC design and in the low level software enabling team. So, uh, Luis has an electronics engineering degree from Instituto Tecnológico de Costa Rica. Uh, he also has a master's degree in business administration by the European Business School in Madrid. And over the last past uh, nine years, Luis has maintained a part-time participation as guest lecturer here at Instituto Tecnológico de Costa Rica, helping to maintain Costa Rica's academy and industry connected and cooperating to help build a healthier ecosystem. So uh, it's really nice to have him here today talking to us. And uh, I will leave you with your audience, Luis. Thank you. You hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, sorry about the disruption. Hope everyone is doing okay. Uh, what just happened is the new normal. We're all uh, trying to make a, a working and teaching and learning from home offices, as you can see in my background. Uh, and yeah, so there are some glitches in the connectivity. Uh, uh, during my little short uh, blackout, I assume that uh, you already have a little bit of my introduction. I'm going to just do it a real quick and overview on, well, uh, who am I and what's the purpose of this session today. So first of all, thank you for having me. My name is Luis Rosales. I am an engineering manager in Intel Costa Rica, uh, more specifically in the client computing group. Um, with uh, four years working with company and uh, well also I have uh, some background from other multinational companies located here in Costa Rica and the purpose today is uh, since it is an industrial talk uh, the idea is uh, we're going to try to cover the story on how Intel started in Costa Rica and how it has evolved basically to set up some context on the evolution of the company as one of the uh, one of the companies with longer story in terms of microelectronics and how that has evolved in a country like ours, uh, which somehow represents the the uh, typical characteristics uh, that we are starting to see in the whole Latin American region. So uh, basically the idea is 
we should have by the end of this conversation some insights on how Intel transfer from being a manufacturing facility in Costa Rica into a design center. Uh, it's more than a design center. Uh, we will briefly mention a couple of new activities that are being charged in the in the country. But the idea is uh, to to give an overview on how the evolution of the business could be an indicator or an use case or an example on how other companies or how the microelectronics industry may develop in the Latin America region, knowing that we have our very unique set of characteristics. So let me set up some context. Uh, the story begins in early 1997 when Intel made the decision to install a manufacturing facility or what most of the people knew around as the factory just for the short term in Costa Rica. Uh, back then that was uh, a completely out of the normal kind of investment for the country and was a completely out of the normal kind of new investment for the company, uh, especially knowing that the traditional uh, approach for Intel develop uh, the manufacturing related business was to invest in markets in the Asia, greater Asia region. That's where most of their operations were. Uh, but in, in that particular point in time, they were looking for a different alternative. Uh, they were looking, even they were willing to increase to some extent the cost of investment and somehow create a balance between the bigger cost but a shorter difference in time zones. Um, that's how they ended up with a list of countries, uh, multiple countries in Latin America, and they made the decision to invest in Costa Rica based on a series of uh, different events. Uh, how that changed the country and how that changed then later in 2014 over an inflection point in the business uh, towards now having a more developed, a more specialized workforce and more developed uh, work in the area of uh, design, well, research and development, bottom line, uh, for different, uh, uh, for, for very of the, many of the Intel products available out there to the market. So let's put together some timeline. Let's see. There should be, I don't know what this, is this slide, can you see the slide number four? Oh yeah, there it is. So this timeline is basically uh, to set the, uh, the reference on what happened, uh, how the operation, the manufacturing operation grew over from the uh, beginning of 1997 to the 2014 inflection point that I just mentioned, and how, and, and most of the talk is going to be concentrated on how things changed after 2014. So the official announcement of Intel decision to invest in Costa Rica was done in November 1996, uh, and the announcement was, uh, literally, we're going to build a factory. The size of the factory is going to be 400,000 square feet. And the target was to have a population of around 2,000 employees, most of them technicians. So they were not looking for a development facility. They were not really looking for a microelectronics business to be developed in Costa Rica. They were looking for a production line with a cost-effective result, with quality results associated to that. And most important is that production line they wanted to have uh, as close as possible time zone with the uh, headquarters in Santa Clara in California. Uh, so back then when it started, uh, basically the first set of products that Costa Rica started to work on was the production of the, back then was still the Pentium processors. And uh, the main set of reasons why they choose Costa Rica instead of other countries in Latin America was basically the availability of uh, qualified labor at a reasonable cost. And keep in mind that back then in 1996, 1997, qualified um, uh, employee was more like a technician able to operate machinery and to follow given procedures, but they were not looking for actually developing any sort of IP or any sort of testing procedures or any sort of new content creation in the country. Uh, the initial investment was actually pretty large. Uh, they started with uh, an appro approximate commitment of $500 million within the following three years. And um, initially, 
Well, by 1999, they were at the point of uh, around 78% of that initial investment has already been committed and developed. So within a record time, they built uh, at least two large uh, facilities for manufacturing, and those were set up to full operation, and there was still room for it, uh, continued uh, growing. And one of the key factors during this uh, stage in history for the company is uh, overall the numbers of, uh, or the contribution of Intel to Costa Rica's GDP was perceived as one of the key components. It was less than 1%, but when you take it down to the exports analysis, especially the exports of finished products, uh, it was a meaningful number. It was in the range of 35% of total exports were relying only on Intel. And that was basically because the other companies, transnational companies installed back then in the country, they were mainly in the manufacturing of lower added value products. So think of uh, clothing, textile, and other segments. So they were breaking the paradigm. They were breaking the, the normal, they were breaking the rules, and they were basically setting up a bet, a big bet in a country where they haven't done so far. And uh, as a matter of fact, during the following years, all the way up to 2014, Costa Rica was a very good reference for the overall operation in terms of production. They kept a sustained job creation rate and overall the total population of Intel employees remained constant between, well, remained stable between uh, 1,600 and 20, and 2,000, sorry, employees uh, during this time. Again, most of the mix of this population was in the technicians area. And then we get to the point, I mean, everything was pretty much stable. Uh, between the 2004 and 2014, the operation increased. So the total headcount uh, shifted over to 3,000 employees, still in the same approach, still in manufacturing. and. Uh, the number of specialized workers that were hired by the company during that time frame was mainly to support the engineering processes behind the manufacturing procedures. So to put it in a certain way, the engineering services that they were consuming from the Costa Rican society was mainly allocated to sustain and increase the productivity, the quality assessment, and the production of units uh, mainly for the Xeon market, but some other products as well were developing here. 2014 is the inflection point on this story. So if you see from 1997 all the way up to 2014, most of the operation was basically sustained, growing, growing, and growing, but growing in terms of numbers, productivity, uh, but re really it was the same process just being improved. Um, and in 2014 is where it was actually an interesting inflection point. Intel made the decision that manufacturing operations are no longer going to be sustained in Costa Rica, are going to be transferred to Asia. Kind of contradictory to the very first origins of the operation in the country. But well, it, it's what was, uh, it, it was, was, was decided by the upper management of the company back then. Uh, this decision created a lot of, well, the, the impact was deep, not only in the company, uh, some of the business operations clearly had to be shut down in the country and that was impacting some of the population. Uh, remember the mix that we had in population was mostly on the technician side, where technicians in the Costa Rica field is basically high school plus uh, some degree of specialization in uh, certain areas, but it lacks of the deeper formation that one gets on engineering or, well, basically college formation was missing in there. So 2014 was an impact in terms of society, in terms of economy, and of course, in terms of businesses. Uh, so at that point, Intel Costa Rica was forced to reinvent. Basically, they need to drastically change the business model they have been sustaining. And knowing the main reason why the operation has been moved, the manufacturing operation is moved out of Costa Rica and into the Asian markets. The main reason for that is cost effectiveness. So we need to be realistic. Costa Rica is not a very cost efficient uh, geography for that kind of operations. Uh, the increase in demand in, uh, in employees was not something we can afford considering that the population of the country uh, back then was nearing the uh, 4 million to 5 million people and the level of specialization was not reaching the desired levels for other activities. 
during the first stage of this story then, Intel was basically growing a business that was heavily relying on productivity and not necessarily in talent. Now, something that happened in parallel to that is along with the production, Intel has been always a company in the country with a big degree of social responsibility and there has always been a very natural collaboration with the academy, especially with the public universities in Costa Rica, which are the main uh, sources for uh, some of the talent that Intel was looking back then. So through that, uh, in 2014, the decision was we need to change, we're forced to change the business proposition that we have, and we're going to look for, instead of producing uh, products, the processors, let's put it that way, we are going to switch over to services, R&D, engineering, and some other activities that are a higher place in the value proposition. Uh, so interesting at this point is the company was forced to take a different look at the labor market in Costa Rica, take a different approach in how the academy is being preparing the uh, engineering population and what kind of projects have been co-developed with the academy. And clearly now we're not looking for technicians with a reasonable level of English. Uh, now we need engineers because now we want to switch over from just being the production line into the ones or the engineers, the teams that provide support to the whole manufacturing process behind that. So we wanted to get into the micro design, we wanted to get into the product development, we wanted to get into the platform development, and we also wanted to take a leverage of other local title availability in the areas of shared services and software development. So after 2014, there's been three main areas that uh, Intel Costa Rica has been working on. Shared services, which basically means from Costa Rica, we are running services for the whole company in areas like human resources, finance, and others. Uh, IT, so the whole infrastructure for information technology is supported uh, from Costa Rica. So from here, let's say there is a need for a new application that is going to help from you can think of anything like managing the vacation request system for the employees all the way up to we need a new application that is going to help drive the testers that are located in laboratories uh, that happens through here and the one we're going to talk most today is what happened in R&D and how the new business model uh, enabled Intel in Costa Rica to basically bring new value proposition and land new businesses related more towards the microelectronics than actually production in the country. So let me switch over to the next foil. Somehow what we did is then from 1997 to 2014, uh, basically it was an operation of start and grow and it kept growing the production. Uh, yeah, I must say the employees, we take some pride in still seeing some processor that's at Costa Rica printed in the, in the end product. Uh, but after 2014, that didn't continue. It was not possible for us to continue sustaining a massive production without having or undergoing through a massive uh, refactoring uh, and the cost effectiveness was really the blocking factor. So the decision was we need to start an R&D center. So short term for that, we, we know it collectively as CRDC, Costa Rica Design Center. And we started by basically leverage, leveraging the learnings and the expertise that we had or somehow we inherited from the manufacturing era. So the initial set of activities were developed in the engineering unit testing and packaging. Those are the two commercial names that we use for in the terms of engineering unit testing, uh, the very first approach to a more microelectronics oriented uh, business was to have Costa Rican engineering to develop the set of low level testing that is going to be applied to new generation of chips. In other words, let's put it with some commercial names to make it probably more familiar. 
Right now, Intel has recently announced uh, Generation 11 for the Core i7, Core i5 family of products. Uh, before that hits the market, there is going to be a series of testing, functional testing that needs to happen at the microarchitecture level. And typically, and during the, the first stage of the company in, in the country, that testing came from somewhere else. We didn't even question who is putting together these tests and where are these coming from and what are these tests supposed to validate. It was literally just, uh, it, it was basically just grab the test and run it through a, a set of units or set of uh, microprocessors and give me the number on how the lot is looking. Uh, the first approach after 2014 was now we're going to be the ones developing that kind of testing. So uh, that's where some of the engineering teams that were part of the manufacturing process were repurposed into now you need to develop testing for the some of the blocks, not all of them, but some of the blocks that are part of the uh, pipeline or the microarchitecture of the new generation of uh, SOCs. So we had uh, tests created for blocks like reset, which basically means we need to validate uh, the different possible uh, reset sequences occurring at the CPU level are following the right set of steps. And if any of these steps is failing, what kind of error are we catching in there? And how can we then classify that error as something that is happening because the test is not correctly created, the unit where we run the test is defective, or somehow extrapolate that to the batch of units that we're testing have this common error, which will be a class error that needs to be corrected as soon as possible. Packaging was one of the remainings from the manufacturing era. So packaging stayed for a few more months uh, after 20, 2014 transition. And that was basically Costa Rica continued to support the low scale productivity of some of the products for some time. Uh, that was kind of also aligned to uh, engineering. And one of the things that enabled packaging was to have this transition between just the production and now into the test content creation. As we started to move forward, some other components were added to the family of engineering. So these two were the first units, uh, the first engineering teams that started operations in Costa Rica after the factory shut down. So then we started to get engineers in the IP design. And so probably IP design is one of the most relevant blocks in here uh, because it happens to be one of the most complex processes uh, that Intel has. Clearly the IP is uh, one of the most sensitive informations that we try to protect. Uh, also the construction of an SOC implies complex interaction of multiple blocks developed by different teams in different locations. And somehow you need also a very, very strong integration unit that is going to put all of the parts together, plus the uh, the settings or the structures that are, are going to enable the construction of different commercial SKUs. So IP design is uh, one of the blocks where the Costa Rica engineering teams started by helping in the mainly in one particular block, which is the graphics area and one particular process or uh, step in the design process, which is mainly physical design. So what it means is out of the many blocks that we embed as part of one of our SOCs, graphics is, well, graphics is clearly uh, targeted at mainly at the client computing devices, uh, not only them, but uh, it's, it's the, the particular use case, and more specifically at the mobile, or what we call mobile, which is basically the SOCs that Intel produces for laptops uh, and some other mobile devices. So this team started leveraging tools and knowledge from other uh, geographies that will help take an RTL or take a partition out of an RTL design that comes from somewhere else, typically it's going to be a partition uh, in the sense of we have a complex product that is going to be breaking down into simpler units. And that partition is going to be, I mean, the, the, the whole purpose of the physical design teams here is to work on multiple partitions and basically adjust the new design rules that are defined for the manufacturing process that is going to be used for this uh, particular unit and find out which kind of errors are the 
detected. And of course, correct those errors in a way that the partition eventually converges. And once we get the conversion point, uh, we can claim this one is ready to go to the integration process and the final set of testings prior to uh, manufacturing procedures. Uh, that goes hand in hand with the test content development. So we know the partitions are being created, we know the partitions are being cleared out of errors, and we know once the integration is complete, we need to have a thorough set of testing created for it to be sustainable. So the kind of tests that we have been putting together, uh, depending on the product, we have covered uh, reset, we have covered um, memory arrays, interfaces, uh, etc. There are multiple blocks where the testing goes from very basic level of testing, like uh, recent sequences or uh, proper checks uh, of the processor following the right sequence of steps during the start or during the enablement of an operating system at the platform level, um, all the way up to uh, finding out functionalities are correct for end user, which is one of the latest blocks that uh, we're adding to our engineering capabilities. Um, one interesting component that has been added more recently, and I listed in there as software development and platform development, is during the first years after the transition, so 2014 to approximately 2017, 2018, um, the main set of actions were around the SOC. Um, however, one of the things the company wants to change is the perception that Intel is only a manufacturer of SOCs. Uh, we actually uh, develop beyond the SOC, we develop uh, what, we, what we want to call a solution. So the platform is basically a reference board that is developed by our teams here, and that reference board is going to be used as an enabler for potential customers who will be using our products to build their end state product, uh, to put it in a certain way. Um, one of the things that changed in uh, the past five years was the inclusion of the Client Computing Group engineering team in Costa Rica, which actually is uh, is an engineering team that is not directly focused on the development of the SOC, but is a team that works on the enablement of the SOC as a computing platform. And that reference board or that reference design is uh, the one that we're going to deliver to OEMs like Dell, HP, Lenovo, and all those manufacturers so they can validate their designs, test what they are doing, and basically ensure that their design is meeting our specification. So by the time the silicon is ready out of manufacturing, we have a smoother integration transition uh, time. And that is also being complemented with uh, the creation of tools, which is what I reflect there as software development. So this is not software in the sense of, yeah, we also build uh, uh, applications that are going to be visible to the end user of the computer. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, instead, that software development is, for instance, EDA tools that are custom created to meet into regulations, restrictions, and targets, and transfer that as a service to the designers in the OEMs so they can build a platform that meets the specifications uh, the SOC has. So, in a sense, I'll try to summarize this way. Let's see, slide should be loading. So, in the left side of the screen, uh, between the two yellow lines, which is basically between these two points, is basically a picture of what was the initial operation of Intel in Costa Rica, and you see it lasted for quite a few years, and how that concentrated mainly in the SOC verification, SOC production. There were some other fields, some other areas, but the, the main portion of the production in the country and the operation of the company in the country was in there how things have evolved since 2014. So it's a shorter time, it's a much more aggressive transition, and clearly it's something that is beyond the 
company capabilities only. It's something that actually happened thanks to the ecosystem, including the academy and including also the support and some of the cr crucial changes the government has done over time. So we have expanded capabilities. Now production is very little, is not like uh, one of our main business areas. And as you can see, now we have a broader spectrum of activities. From uh, the indirect participation in product roadmap definition, that basically means through, uh, let's say, through characterization work that it's been done here in Costa Rica for current silicon products, we can uh, help predict or project performance number, targets, power consumption, uh, signal integrity, power integrity conditions that need to be reflected on next generation products. That feeds back into the product roadmap definition and the product target definition. So somehow we're also influencing the decision of which are the new SKUs that Intel is going to place out there in the market. Uh, moving down the structure, uh, um, where is the band? Okay, here. Moving down the structure, we have also increased not only in the portion of SOC design, we're also participating in the platform design. So that basically means we have expanded our capabilities beyond you know, developing testing content uh, for the SOC or uh, working closely with partition decomposition, partition conversion, uh, conflict resolution, and EDA design or customization of EDA tools to support the SOC design activities, testing and verification. We have also expanded that capability, let's say uh, outside of the SOC world and into the intermediate neighbor devices. So we have teams working in the design and development of uh, PCBs for boards that are ultimately going to be the reference board design. For, for other manufacturers, mainly OEMs and ODMs, who will build their own uh, products based in our specification. And that somehow requires, uh, has required engineering teams to leverage some of the capabilities from the SOC design and also bring up talent from the, well, the labor market and the academy that is going to help us design uh, boards that are not only meeting into regulations, but also need to be in agreement with standards for different kind of uh, protocols. So we cannot just come up with, yeah, this set of tracks are going to support a Thunderbolt connectivity that needs to be in adherence to the Thunderbolt standard and needs also to be synchronized and aligned with the specification of the product that is being defined internally. Um, those are not only created that also need to be tested and verified. So a lot of work is done in simulation and uh, projection so we can tell if uh, our designs are going to meet certain uh, targets in terms of performance, power, and uh, productivity. Meaning, well, it depends on the application and the segment. We have, for instance, teams working with the IoT commercial segment and their targets for performance are going to be basically uh, reduced down to responsiveness of the overall SOC as the key metric. Whereas uh, the teams putting together graphics products, their main performance metric is going to be quality of the video they are transmitting. So think of frames per second if that's a relevant metrics for that. And uh, in the recent time, actually the last portion over here is a natural expansion of the engineering services. So one of the things or one of the processes that we follow for a new generation of silicon to be created is we rely on simulations. Uh, some of these are internally created simulators. Some of them are architecturally accurate simulators where you can literally uh, drop an RTL model for a given functional unit and use it just as it was a silicon already created component and interface it with some other stimuli generator and testers uh, blocks. Um, so from here we have expanded the capabilities to have that simulation to be created from Costa Rica and to be somehow used in some of the uh, product lines that we are covering here. And that has helped actually uh, the team to grow in even certain areas. Now this is probably stepping out of the electronics field and more into the product design field, which are 
tied, but not necessarily in the same technical field. So now we have the opportunity to start influencing and partnering with the ecosystem for product development, which basically means uh, we have grown over time uh, enough knowledge and um, multidisciplinary fields so we can merge some of the SOC design knowledge, uh, some of the platform design knowledge, some of the software development knowledge, and by putting all together, we are now in a stage where we're building certification tools, which basically is a series of tools that we're going to provide to the product developer, think of Dell, HP, Lenovo, again, any of the OEMs, so they can validate their design and basically tell whether it is meeting expectations or not. So that is part of the work, most recent work. Uh, in fact, that has uh, probably less than a year. And from Costa Rica, we are actively contributing to, for instance, to the recent launch of Intel Evo, which is a commercial branding for uh, platforms designed or laptops designs that are created to meet given user specifications and through all this integration of the different engineering teams that we have, all this feedback that we're getting from the OEMs, from the end users, from the laptop design ecosystem at the end of the day, is going to be interiorized and be fed back into the different areas down to the point of we are now going to have targets that are driven by the end user experience. And those targets are going to be translated into power consumption metrics or goals uh, uh, signal integrity metrics, um, frequency limits for the CPU operation, pipeline depth, uh, inclusion or management of different peripherals, and so on and so off. So, to close on this and basically leave a few more minutes for questions, the takeaways. Uh, what are the key takeaways out of this talk? Out of this talk, what I wanted is First of all, uh, even though Intel has been in Costa Rica since 1997, reality is, or historic reality is telling us that microelectronics hasn't been the most solid industry or business in Latin America. That's a reality, uh, but also the particular use case of Intel, uh, I am convinced that it is a good example on how the lack of a cost-effective structure in Latin America compared to other markets like Asia has created either a problem or an opportunity. I think the particular case of Intel Costa Rica shows how that transformed into an opportunity to move forward from a heavily technical task strictly related to the product manufacturing into now a much more diverse portfolio of engineering services and products uh, and how those services and products are possible and enabled only if the industry aligns with the immediate ecosystem around which is basically academy and is uh, government the very reason why we're having this talk today i think uh, it's a result of this cooperation between Intel as a representative of the industry. And I can tell it's not the only company. I, in fact, after 97, when Intel decided to start operations in Costa Rica, the different multinational companies that decided to invest in the country have moved from traditional manufacturing procedures or business into a more technologically advanced services there is a bigger investment from external companies in software development, cybersecurity, uh, and some other, and also in the R&D fields for ASIC design uh, and product development. So to me, uh, the very reason of this talk is to share my perception. Uh, and uh, I believe it's, uh, it's a good example on how we can leverage the talent that is available in the region. Uh, I must say I was impressed by, by uh, all the announcement at the beginning of these talks uh, from Ricardo. All these talks and a lot of these speakers are from Latin America universities. I've worked with Ronnie and with some of the professors at uh, Tech in Costa Rica and I can tell the Academy has done a tremendous advance over the past few years. We are far past the point of uh, an academy that is strictly created to graduate engineers 
and now it's moving towards uh, increased added value, which uh, in uh, in joint effort with the industry can help build more value businesses in the country and in the region. Okay, Ronnie, should I go with the questions that are popping up on the chat? All right, yeah, so thank you very much, Luis, for that talk, and it's very interesting. And we have a couple of questions for you here. The first one is from Ricardo. No, I'm sorry, this is from the, from the YouTube. It's from Samuel Alvarez. He's asking, what do you think are Intel's expectations in Costa Rica for the next few years? I assume he is talking about the growing expectations. Yes. So first, to, to answer to that, uh, the growth is being measured different now. It's not only a matter of adding more uh, headcount. Uh, we have managed to recover the headcount position that we had in 2014. So before 2014, the, the, the headcount picked up on, on 3,000 employees, then it went down to 1,500. Now it's in the 2,000 around, uh, something like that. But the expectation is to grow not only in headcount, but also in uh, business units with investments in Costa Rica. So for instance, the one that I'm working on right now is uh, fairly recent. It, Created, it was created in uh, almost a year ago in October 2019 and is in the area of platform development. Um, so platform development in the sense of how do we get the platform certified for the client computing group. Likewise, there's other business units that are looking for investment in the country. So the idea is, or the plans uh, for the company are to increase the presence in more engineering related processes and uh, to basically expand the type and quality of the products that we are working on. So right now we have impact in server segment, so the C online products, client server, the core family, uh, sorry, client uh, processors, the core families, and uh, IoT with the Atom products. All right, thank you very much. We have more questions. This one comes from Cesar Duenas, who is from NXP Brazil. And he's asking, what is the size of your R&D operation today and what are the profile of the professionals? Are they mainly Costa Ricans or do they come from other countries as well? Okay. So the size. Uh, R&D operation started in 2014 with around 400 people. And now it has grown to about uh, 1,500. Uh, that's the total population. And the composition is... Uh, Let's see, in terms of profession, mainly engineering. Uh, some of these uh, professionals are also in this in the data science fields. We also have people that is more like in the uh, natural science fields, but the, the, the top of the, of the pie is going to be uh, engineering. Within the engineering population, uh, we have basically three main profiles. Uh, computer science, electronics engineering, and uh, the, the third one is going to be computer engineering, uh, which is basically kind of a hybrid, the, the middle ground between computer science and electronics engineering. Electronics is probably uh, the one with the biggest number of hiring, and in the computer science side, we're we're it's basically where we have some of the tool development at a higher level. And computer engineering happens to be like the middle professional that is somehow connecting the software developers with the hardware developers uh, in, in the middle point. Um, regarding nationalities, yes, they are mainly Costa Ricans uh, for a series of reasons. One of the most relevant reasons here is hiring uh, an, an expat requires some additional paperwork that takes some time. Uh, but it doesn't mean we only hire Costa Ricans. Uh, there's, uh, there's representatives from other countries, Latin America and the US and even some Europeans in the R&D center. Uh, but being completely honest, uh, the, uh, the non-Costa Rican hiring has been, uh, it, it's not reaching up to a 10%, I'll say. All right, thank you very much. So we have another question. Uh, this is from Cesar Duenas as well. He is asking, which academic institutions are your major partners? 
in the particular case of Costa Rica, we have a team of volunteers who work with uh, different universities. Uh, depending on the specific area, we have partnership with different colleges. In the engineering field, the main, the two main institutions that are partners with Intel have been Tech Tecnológico de Costa Rica and uh, UCR Universidad de Costa Rica. Uh, but we also have partnerships with some private universities like Texas Tech, uh, ULACID, uh, Semfotech, and some others in different areas, mainly in the software development and data science field. All right, so we have another question. This one comes from Juan Pablo Martinez Brito. He is from SayTech Brazil and he's asking, so he says, very great talk. Can you comment on Intel using TSMC for manufacturing? Is Intel giving up on manufacturing in ultra scale process notes? Thank you. So that, that is, uh, well, th thanks for your comment, Juan Pablo. Uh, whether Intel is going to use TSMC or not, uh, that is a decision that is really way out of my league. It's uh, something that happens at a very, very high levels in the company management. Uh, however, historically, that has happened before, not for the primary line of products, but at least for some of the secondary products like, uh, well, some of, some of the supporting chips that go on top of the main board. Um, in terms of how manufacturing is evolving for Intel, yes, we have been uh, making some, but we, we have struggled with some of our procedures that has been worked uh, full steam ahead. And there's no line of sight at least to say Intel is going to get rid of manufacturing just outsourced to some someone else. So my opinion is that's not going to happen in the short term. Uh, I don't think Intel wants to get rid of that business in the, at the moment. Right, thank you. So we have one more question. This one comes from Ricardo, uh, Ricardo Reyes, and he's asking, uh, can you give us some examples of chip design SOCs done at Intel Costa Rica? It's not like uh, we develop the whole SOC, we contribute to some of the SOCs. One particular example is uh, the recently announced XE, which is the graphics coprocessor that comes along with uh, Gen 11 uh, core systems. Uh, mainly on the Core i7. So within that integrated uh, graphic processor, there is a uh, contribution from Costa Rican physical design engineers who have done some of the partitions, uh, conversion, convergence, uh, some of the conflict cleanup on those partitions were also done in Costa Rica. And that's probably the most recent example where we have had some participation. But again, the, the whole SOC, is complex, complex enough to tell that's going to be developed only by Costa Rica or only by the US. The reality is it comes with contributions from many different uh, design centers, consider Ireland, Israel, uh, Malaysia, Costa Rica, Santa Clara, and so on. All right. So another question says, which EDA tools are you using on chip design? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, there, I, I don't have specific names for that. Uh, what I can tell is some of these tools are actually uh, been modified or some of these are actually created in-house to meet specific demands. Uh, we do use some commercially available tools. I mean, that's part of the partnerships that we have, uh, but I don't have top of my mind uh, any specific tool that is being used. All right. So we have one comment uh, here. Impressive results. I'm glad to see that Central American talent is being taped with great ta results. Pura vida. Right. Thank you very much. Gracias. <laughs> okay. We're on top of the hour. Any more questions? I think you're on mute, Ronnie. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, you're right. right. I so I have uh, just one question more, and it's uh, this. What, what do you think are the main roadblocks that uh, Intel Costa Rica is facing to keep growing? 
One of the main challenges is as the SOCs and the processes get more and more sophisticated and more complex, uh, the acquisition of talent is becoming challenging because you don't, I mean, you need to find the right balance between the right academic formation and the right uh, combination with experience or expertise. Uh, it's really hard to find that talent combination. And here, I think the, the key to develop that is to have a close interaction with the academy. So that's why we try to keep a close relationship with the, with the universities. And we believe somehow the evolution of the businesses of the company is a reflect of what's happening in the academy. 10 years ago, and uh, you could talk about tech, there was not even a master's degree program in electronics engineering. Now you're uh, you have even a PhD program, which somehow reflects that same need to develop uh, more uh, skilled talent, both in the academy and the industry. So we need to go hand in hand in that. Right. Thank you very much, Luis Carlos. It was really interesting. I don't know, Ricardo, you have something else to add? No, I just wanted to say thank you and good luck with all these conferences and the presentations. Uh, we have been following Laskas closely. Uh, it's really interesting and uh, well, we would like to at some point find out uh, alternatives to contribute more, at least from the industry side. And thanks again for the opportunity. It's really good to be here. Thank you.